Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final bar. Happy Friday. We'll do our normal Friday routine where we wrap the week. We focus on how the charts have evolved over the last five trading days. And if you are more bullishly minded, you're probably pretty happy with the evolution of this week. Although we have had some fits and starts, had some choppiness overall, the market really netting out to a positive week, continuing to push to the upside with technology leading the way yet again on a Friday afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Friday edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the markets using the power of stock charts, using the tools of the technical toolkit, uh, technical analysis, behavioral finance, investor sentiment, psychology, breadth, trend, momentum, all of those tools to try to make sense of these markets in uncertain times. And while the conditions surrounding the markets have certainly been uncertain in terms of what the Fed is going to do as they evolve their interest rate policy, uh, the geopolitical spectrum and and, uh, and all the different events that we're, we're hearing about uh, globally, the pandemic and how that is continuing to evolve, getting a little more challenging over time here in the, uh, in the US, At the end of the day market continues to resolve uh, upwards, right? Uh, weeks and months are continuing to push to the upside. And uh, again, one of my mentors, Paul Montgomery, who wrote the newsletter Universal Economics for decades, over 50 years, my favorite quote of his, the most bullet, bullish thing the market can do is go up, right? So if you know nothing else about the S&P 500, about the uh, equity market conditions, look at a chart of the S&P. You can see the pattern of higher highs and higher lows as we continue to push onward and ever upward. I'm inclined to expect that to continue until proven otherwise. Have not seen it yet uh, so far with this week continuing to push to the upside. We have great guests on the show. I had a lot of fun yesterday talking with Denise Chisholm, one of my former Fidelity colleagues. Earlier this week, Bob Lang, many others that have uh, shared their expertise with uh, with all of us. Next week, we'll be taking Monday off for the uh, market holiday on Labor Day. So I hope you have a, a great long day, uh, long weekend uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, Tuesday, we'll do our normal Monday routine where we uh, where we approach the market from three directions, top down, bottom up, and sector rotation. On Wednesday the 8th, we have Ryan Dietrich, who's the uh, strategist at LPL Financial. On Thursday the 9th, Todd Sohn from Strategus. Coming up the week after, on Tuesday, uh, September 14th, we have Louis Giannis from WealthNet Investments coming to us from uh, Car Colorado. So a lot of great guests. And again, one of the great joys of this show for me is being able to bring in some really smart people uh, who have some incredibly uh, effective toolkits to help just share a little bit of the of what they're seeing and what they're hearing. And I think if you listen to what we talk about in terms of the charts we review and you listen to some of these guests, hopefully you have a pretty good read uh, for the market environment overall. Let us wrap the week. Uh, we have two pieces to today's show. We wrap the week first, and then we will go to uh, our uh, final bar mailbag here in a few moments. I want to start quickly with a poll. We asked all of you recently, which of these would you rather own over the next three months, consumer discretionary, consumer staples, or cash. And the chart that I usually use actually comes from our Mindful Investor Live chart list, which we'll come back to here in a little bit. But to start off, let's go to the chart of consumer discretionary to consumer staples, which is this one right here. The reason why we wanted to pose this question to you is because really the relative performance of these two sectors has been relatively consistent. It's actually been fairly sideways. So these two sectors have been moving together. Now, if that surprises you, because the market overall has been obviously stronger from March to September, but the relative strength, the, the ratio of these two sectors is flat. It's because you have some of the larger names that have struggled. Tesla, Home Depot, Amazon are the three biggest stocks within consumer discretionary and consumer staples. You have some charts that are actually working okay. While you have plenty that are struggling, like Brown Foreman and many others, you have charts like maybe some of the um, tobacco names that are bouncing up, things like Kroger and Costco, which we've talked about in long-term uptrends. So in the end, this nets out to a flat relative line. So 58% of you in terms of the results voted for consumer discretionary, only 24% consumer staples, only 18% opted to be in cash. If I were to vote, I would probably agree with the majority here and vote consumer discretionary. I think the time frame is key. If you ask me about the next month, I might say cash, which seems kind of crazy, but I wouldn't mind sitting out the seasonally weakest part of the uh, of the year 
uh, the month of September and uh, and assuming that I can get back in at a, at a good level in a couple of weeks. But overall, I'm going to I'm going to follow the trends. And I think consumer discretionary certainly has potential for further upside. The bottom of the uh, the equal weighted version of those two. And you can see it continuing to push onward and ever upward. Let's continue on with our wrap the week segment. So what we like to do next is focus on the weekly change. Uh, so we're looking at these four, uh, sorry, this group of asset classes over the last five trading days, starting the clock last Friday and going to today, the S&P actually finished that stretch uh, up 0.6% for the week. So sort of mildly uh, bullish move to the uh, to the overall week. Three asset classes underperformed large cap stocks this week. Uh, gold actually popped higher uh, Thursday into Friday, so finished up half a percent using the GLD. Two of the asset classes were down on the week. The dollar index, which is here in green, was down 0.6%. In red, we have the worst performers, which are uh, which are, uh, long bonds, uh, actually the, the TLT, the bond ETF, which was down 0.7%. Everything else actually outperformed stocks this week. In purple, we have the uh, IWM, this is the Russell 2000 ETF, up just a little bit more than the S&P. In brown, we have crude oil up 1.1%. In pink, the NASDAQ 100 up 1.5%. We now get to the big winners for the week, Bitcoin, which actually started the week relatively weak, but then reverted back to the upside. We've seen Bitcoin approach that 50,000 level, pushing above it in the last 24 hours, which is a, an impressive uh, potential follow through, which is what I'll be looking at over the weekend, up 2.7%. The best performer, though, surprisingly enough, emerging markets, EM, were up almost uh, 3% this week. So the S&P up 0.6%, you have EM up 3%. We don't often get to the, uh, the the ratio of emerging markets to developed markets. It's on my Mindful Investor Live chart list. We usually get about halfway through that list of charts, by the way. We don't get through all the ratios that I like to review as part of my, uh, my process. So I'd encourage you to copy that chart list. Uh, to your own log, and you can go through some of those ratios because you'll see that actually EM has really started to revert higher versus uh, developed markets. EM has been a consistent underperformer. You're starting to see signs of life with uh, the commodity complex starting to bounce higher uh, this week. So maybe maybe worth a look in some of those markets you may have been ignoring recently. Let's continue on and finish up our Wrap the Week segment. Look at the Mindful Investor Live chart list. This is a chart list that I maintain. You all have access to it as Stock Charts members. I'd encourage you to check it out. Um, the way to get to it, by the way, is go to the Articles tab uh, at the very top of our Stock Charts website. Go to uh, my homepage, which is called The Mindful Investor. And at the very top, you see this little gray button that says Live Chart List. That will take you to this list of charts that we're looking at. Now you are welcome to copy them to your own login, save them, Share them with your friends, do whatever you like with them. We start as always with the S&P market trend model. It's actually pretty interesting. The long-term model has been bullish uh, for over a year now. Last June, June of 2020, a couple months after the, uh, the major low in March of 2020, this uh, long-term model turned positive and has remained uh, you know, incredibly positive through that entire period. Overall, still very much in a position of strength, with me, which makes sense. You know, the medium term model, I spent a lot of time thinking about this this week because I'm just I'm noticing as the market continues higher, my medium term trend model, medium term market trend model has remained negative. And while I appreciate that, I very much have, have liked that because May is really when the bull market stopped for all the cyclical sectors or most of them, right? Most of the names that led into May have come back and have retreated quite a bit is when the breadth conditions deteriorated. And so having the medium term model be negative really helped me to think about potential risk versus retention, potential reward, particularly in some of those names, and to make sure that stops and lines in the sand were all updated. However, I can't help but notice that the markets continue to push higher. So visually, I would argue that the medium-term medium -term trend is very positive, but the models actually remain negative. This is based purely on the weekly MACD or the weekly PPO, which is uh, which has remained negative, I think, really because of the construction of that indicator using the signal line. So I'm looking to see if there may be a better way to measure the medium term trend that uh, that is able to follow the markets a little more uh, effectively. Uh, overall, I like the fact that it's made me think more about a potential risk. It's still net negative. It has not quite turned positive uh, as of uh, the close here on Friday. So medium term remains negative for my current model. The short term model has remained positive. It's only been a couple of weeks, maybe uh, less than five weeks over the, the last uh, eight months where the uh, the uh, short term model has been positive to finish the week, which just speaks to the way that the weeks tend to end in a position of strength higher than the previous Friday. The chart of the S&P, I feel like in the last couple of days, we've we've hit this pretty hard, so I don't mean to uh, to beat it. Uh, over and over, I just wouldn't would uh, you know I've updated all of these levels with the the lines in the sand that I think are key. 
you know, one of the key uh, important things to measure are just the highs and the lows, right? Are the highs getting higher, which they are yet again this week with new all-time highs? Are the lows getting lower, which would be an indication that the trend is starting to turn? The most recent swing low, because we've accelerated so much, is down here around 4360. That's the low from mid-August. And I'm just going to take a moment and look at how far away that is. We have this great little uh, percentage change tool. I don't mean to just fly through stock charts, but we've click on annotate, go to the little letters here. These are all sort of the things, uh, you know, words and price levels and things that you can overlay, Elliott wave counts and all of that. If we would sell off dramatically next week, that'd be a 4.2% drop or so from the highest point this week uh, to that uh, to that swing low. So if we would come back and test that in the month of September, that would literally be probably the median uh, or would by definition be the medium, would be about an average pullback so far in 2021. Four to, you know, four, four and a half percent is about the uh, the average of these uh, four pullbacks that we've had so far. So it might be something to think about in terms of, uh, of uh, potential support if we would pull back. But again, lower high, lower low, breaking the 50 day. Those would be the three things that I would be looking for. The 50 day moving average, I think, is the most important one. That has been tried and true through the course of 2021. We have tested it a number of times and every single time has uh, have bounced higher. So I think you can you can assume that the market finds support when it nears that level. I think a lot of people are focused on that. But it also tells me that when that level is broken, when a level has been tested many times and 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 maintained support, that's encouraging. But if and when that breaks, I think you will find a flood to the exits as people recognize that the market conditions are now changing. So that might be something to look for uh, going through this seasonally weakest part of the year. Talk about not weakness, but instead strength. I will show you my main breadth chart, which is looking at the cumulative advanced decline lines. Uh, we have the S&P 500 at the top. We then have four AD lines. The advanced decline lines is a cumulative measure. So every day, how many stocks in these buckets close higher versus lower? That will give you a net change and you string together all those net changes. You get this cumulative reading on advancers versus decliners. The S&P advanced decline line has remained bullish, in my opinion. It's It's been green this entire stretch for the last 12 months as it continues to make new highs and new lows along with the market. These others, starting in June, though, have not confirmed new all-time highs. So in June, July, August, you had a lower trend uh, in the uh, NYSE AD line, in the mid-cap line, and the small-cap line. Two of these now have started to break their recent swing highs, which is why I've now color-coded them subjectively back to the green bullish color. So uh, a couple of these, the NYSE and the mid cap breadth lines have broken above their most recent swing high from uh, earlier in the month of August. I think that indicates enough of a positive rotation to consider them positive. I'm still considering the breadth on small caps to be uh, neutral, right? It's sort of range bound, uh, lower highs and higher lows until we break above that swing high from early August. That will remain neutral for me. So interesting, the breadth conditions, which had been negative June into July, now rotating back to the upside, confirming the underlying strength that we've seen. We've seen more and more new highs on the S&P 500, more new highs on the New York Stock Exchange. This is looking at 52-week new highs and new lows. In my own process for uh, for market misbehavior premium members, uh, usually a couple times a week, I'll screen for stocks making new three-month highs and lows. That's a little bit of a shorter-term time frame helps to capture some of the moves earlier on. This last week, I found 130 stocks in my universe of 10 billion and higher market cap, 130 names that made a new swing high on Wednesday. Only seven made a new swing low. Two weeks ago, it was even between buys and sells or, or between swing highs and swing lows. So it shows you how much the market has changed just in the last couple of weeks. Seven out of 10 S&P 500 stocks are above their 50-day moving average. That is up from 32% in mid-June, in mid which is certainly encouraging. However, that's a lot lower than 92%, which is where it was in April. So while a lot of stocks have recovered their 50-day moving average, that is certainly a net positive. It's worth noting that still a great many of them, 20%, in fact, are still below their 50-day moving average, That uh, assuming uh, that... Uh, that were above there in, in April and now still below there. So it's not everything that is participating, but a lot more. And this trending higher would support the current bull market phase that we see. Still just under 70% of S&P names uh, in, the, uh, in a bullish signal, according to their point and figure chart. So it's interesting that both of those breadth indicators remaining just below 70%. Uh, that's an interesting tell. And it shows you that, that uh, it's, I mean, I'm, it's just the cyclical sectors, it's consumer staples. It's the things that have been struggling a little bit, particularly on a relative basis that are still 
uh, in a bearish phase, but you really have to rotate higher to signal or to trigger a buy signal from a point and figure chart. That's not a leading indicator. It's more of a lagging indicator that would confirm a new uptrend has happened. And so it's illustrating that not everything is participating just yet. But what that tells me, there's potential, uh, there's there's further potential upside as some of those stocks really start to uh, start to participate. We reviewed uh, sentiment in a little more detail yesterday. So if you missed it, go back to Thursday's show. But I would notice that the two things with the AAII survey is that it's back to net bullish over the last couple of weeks, which is overall constructive. Still only 43% of respondents are bullish uh, versus bearish. And so that's not euphoric yet. That's not too bullish. I think that's sort of the healthy range, but I can't help but notice April into June into August, there have been less bulls every time the market makes new highs. Finally, just to highlight a couple of very brief ratios. First off, semiconductors holding in there. This is the relative strength of semis versus the S&P 500, breaking out of this sort of uh, you know congestion pattern, now sort of range bound for the last two months. And I'd love to see if that ratio would be able to hook higher, which can, would confirm a resumption of the uptrend. I've heard a lot of discussion about small cap participation. While that is absolutely true, and the small cap index starting to show signs of life, still relatively weak confirmed uh, relative to large cap stocks over the last six months. We need to take a quick break. We'll be back answering your questions from the final bar mailbag. We'll see you in a minute. Uh, just a couple of quick comments before we get to the final bar mailbag. First off, you can get your questions to us a couple different ways. We love to hear from you. Feedback on myself and our other hosts, some of our different shows and programming, special events and guests that you'd like to see more of. We'd love to hear all of that. But most important to us are questions you are running into as you analyze your own charts. You are not alone. We are here to help support you and point you in the right direction. You can get your questions to us a couple different ways via email, the final bar at stockcharts.com via Twitter at Final Bar SCTV, via YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts channel. We'd love to capture all of those and hope to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag segment, which will be early next week. Also, as a reminder, go to StockChartsTV.com. Use your email address. You can set up a free account. Start watching all of our great content. Fantastic guests like the ones we had this week, Denise Chisholm from Fidelity, Bob Lang from Explosive Options, so many others. Uh, great shows like The Final Bar, The Pitch, special events like our Mid-Year Market Outlook, and our uh, year end in review. You can see all of that content and much, much more at stockchartstv.com or search on any of the app stores for Stock Charts TV on demand. Let us open the final bar mailbag. These are all questions we've received from you in the last uh, 24, 48 hours or so. Uh, and again, get your questions to us at any time via email, the final bar at stockcharts.com. Question number one, does stock charts cover stocks quoted on foreign markets such as London or Australia? Do they have the full range of functionality as U.S. stocks such as seasonality, et cetera? I really appreciate your question. And the, uh, the short answer is yes and no. And here's the somewhat longer but still fairly brief answer. So, yes, we do uh, cover a, a number of non-U.S. markets. Uh, we, we really started focusing on the U.S. markets and have added additional data sources and additional uh, global markets over time. So besides the U.S., the, the markets that we do cover are Canada. We cover London and we cover India, and you can uh, find any stocks listed on those markets. The easiest way, to be honest, if you know the ticker, just enter it at the top. If you don't, just enter the name of the uh, company. So if I start typing Vodafone, I can see the uh, London listing for Vodafone Group, VOD.L. And you'll see for a lot of these, they'll have the multiple listings. So there's a U.S. listing for Vodafone, which is VOD, but you can find the non-U.S. Uh, listings there. Uh, London would be .L for a London listed company, .in for, uh, um, excuse me, India, and .to or one of the other Canadian exchanges for uh, a stock that's listed in Canada. For something in India, just start typing again the name of the company and you'll find the tickers that are listed off and you can find them that way. Um, for, you mentioned particularly Australia. We actually do not have Australian stocks on the platform. We have looked at adding them, adding them onto the platform. We're very interested in thinking about some of the other data sources that we don't have. And, and again, we probably have access to the data. So it's a question of getting them set up. The reason why I'm mentioning that is if you would like us to cover a particular market that we are not covering, would you let us know? Contact our support desk. You can click on the help button in the upper right corner of any stock chart screen. Let us know what markets and uh, exchanges you think we should be adding. The more requests we get for a particular exchange, the more likely we are to add it. That's how we gauge uh, any sort of improvements to the platform, but particularly data. 
Also, if you click on the help button, there's a way to request a symbol if you don't find it. So if you're looking for something, you don't find it, you can ping our help desk and uh, they can help you add a uh, symbol onto the platform fairly easily. Next question, can you please analyze the chart of Coca-Cola? Uh, absolutely. So dollar sign KO, I'm assuming it's the one you're looking at. And let's take a look here. <laughs> Sorry, KO. Uh, how do, do I know my own platform? There we go. So Coca-Cola, it's an interesting chart. This is one of those where I feel like the price and the relative tell you two uh, different stories. You, can, you know, my basic chart is a two-year daily chart. We have the price at the top with a couple moving averages. We have the RSI in the middle, which is a measure of momentum. We have the relative strength at the bottom. And I tend to look at Coke versus the S&P 500. Uh, so KO uh, colon SPY to do that relative ratio. And we can start there. I think regardless of what I will tell you about the price characteristics at the top, which I think are actually fairly constructive, the reason why I would not be super excited about looking at uh, Coca-Cola as a uh, as a stock at this point is because of the relative strength. Look at the, over the last couple of years, there's been a clear and consistent downtrend for KO. And to be totally honest, many of the stocks in the consumer staple sector, the XLP relative strength looks a lot like the uh, the the, uh, the relative strength on Coca Cola, and that's why I think it's it's an underwhelming chart from a technical perspective, particularly thinking of all the other equities that are performing well. Coca Cola has a, has improved. Uh, very decently from its March low. I mean, it, it got down to the 35 level, and this is on adjusted data, so it wasn't quite there, but around about there. And it's gone up about 20 points to currently be in the in the mid 50s, which was a nice run. The problem is that the average stock has actually done a, a lot better than that, and that's why the relative strength line has gone consistently down from the March low to where we're at now. So until you see an improvement in relative strength, that's what would concern me about a chart like this. Now, on an absolute basis, is the chart going higher? Absolutely. I think getting above the December peak was encouraging. This is one of those names that broke above it, retested that breakout level from uh, from above, and then rotated higher. It's above two upward sloping moving averages. All of that is fairly constructive. And I would say that on a price basis, getting above the swing high from July and August, this is one of those stocks that's sort of stabilized and is not quite broken above there. It's also threatening the, the uh, all-time high there from February of 2020. All of that is potentially encouraging. The relative strength is what would cause me to lean away from a name like this right about now. Next question, your guest said to buy with both hands when there's a spike in the VIX. How do you know if the spike is reversing and you have to buy? Um, that sounds like Bob Lang, who was on the show on Wednesday, if I remember right. He did a great job talking about a couple different charts. One of the things we looked at was the chart of the VIX together. And, and if you've watched the show, you know, I don't bring up the VIX too often uh, because I, again, it's not one of the main things that I pay attention to, but I, I, I've i learned to look at anything that can help me get a potential read on the market environment. And what he was basically saying is looking at the shorter term trend and noting the fact that when the VIX spiked really above 20, uh, that's when we've had a, uh, a a pullback and a viable pullback in stocks. So here in June, you can see here in July, you can see here in August, we go above 20, 21 sort of range. And those have been the bi viable pullbacks. So this, this game feels very easy, which is essentially look for the VIX to spike above 20. That's most likely a pullback in stocks. That's the time where you can start to accumulate and you ride the next leg higher. I, you know, again, I'm, I go back to my one of my mentors, Greg Morris, who said new highs are always bullish, except for the last one. Or I'm paraphrasing his quote, which is, which is, uh, which is, uh, I think, well deserved. Right, the the uptrend is in play every time we make new all time highs. Every time the VIX spikes lower, or spikes higher, and it's a viable dip, that makes sense. But the moment that you think that that pattern is going to continue to infinity is when it starts not working, right? And and you'll find plenty of, that's why a lot of trading systems backtest beautifully, but then you go to put real money behind it and all of a sudden it completely fails. Because at some point, the VIX will not stop at 20 or 22. It'll go up to 30 or 40. And that's when you have a big, uh, you know, more of a waterfall decline that you have to, to have to worry about. So the answer to your question is yes. His, his comment was because of this pattern that's emerged and based on the new volatility regime, Seeing a spike in volatility, given this continued uptrend, would be the time to start to buy on the dips. And a VIX above 20 was uh, was the level he was uh, he was talking about. I would share the concern that is implied by your question, which was, how do we know that the VIX is going to stop there? And we don't. You have to assume when you buy on the dips, you have to accept that risk that the dip is the beginning of much uh, of a much deeper move. And that's why when you buy on the dips, you have to make sure that your stop loss is very much in play. So people I know that are successful at buying on dips, of which I know plenty, they do a really good job of managing risk. And it's not just that they every dip that they buy works perfectly. It's that when the dips don't work and when the market continues lower, they get out and minimize their losses. And that's how I would think about that chart if I were you. Finally, 
I'm trying to recreate that factor ETF chart. It looks like you made a perf chart as a sharp chart. How do you set that up? Um, you know, great question. I, you were referring to this one in your question. Uh, this was a chart we reviewed yesterday when I had uh, Denise Chisholm on the show. Uh, one of the three and three, if I remember right, was uh, was looking at this chart. And this is something I shared earlier in the week with, uh, with my market misbehavior premium members looking at um, some of these different asset classes and just pointing out the fact that micro caps are, in fact, the top performing uh, you know, uh, style and uh, and cap tier. So basically, it's the nine cap tiers and style mixes, value, core, and growth, and then throwing micro cap in there as well. You can see micro cap is the top performer. The way you do that is you make a chart of the S&P 500, make it a performance chart, which means you're going to start the line at zero and show the percentage return over that time. Then you add these indicators called price dash performance. Just put the tickers. You can have up to nine or 10 of these, if I remember right, at the uh, bottom and just say behind price down here at the bottom, pick a pretty color to make sense of it. And there you can go uh, and uh, you have a chart just like this. Uh, that is uh, that is the way I created that chart. It's a great way to uh, to visually uh, represent that. Perf charts are great for a lot of things, but I like having the sharp charts for a number of reasons as well. And that's the way you can make it look just like this. Great questions. And again, those are all questions we received from you in the last day or two. We very much appreciate you taking the time to uh, share your questions with us. We need to wrap today's show. Go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is the S&P 500 breadth, breadth by cap tiers. This is one of the uh, first charts in my Mindful Investor Live chart list. We review it every Friday on the show uh, for good reason. This is a, my main way of measuring market breadth. And I think one of the reasons why I've been cautiously optimistic on stocks June, July, and August is the divergence you've had. This is what I call the breadth deterioration or the breadth non-confirmation. The S&P advanced decline line has gone higher all the other AD lines have actually been sloping higher June, July into August. That is now starting to change. And I think this is why this is a key chart to pay attention to, particularly going into next week. Step September is the seasonally weakest month within the seasonally weakest part of the year. May through September or May, May through uh, uh, October actually are the six uh, weaker parts of the month. And then November through April are the seasonally stronger part of the year. Uh, and so we're sort of at the weakest month in the weakest six month period of the year. So overall, if there's going to be a pullback, you would assume that it would be in this uh, this time when pullbacks often happen. But this breadth chart can be a way to determine whether or not you're starting to see pullback in key names. It's actually been rotating higher and the NYSE and mid cap AD lines, I would argue, are now uh, deserve to be color coded green for bullish. Uh, the small cap AD line has not quite confirmed it yet. Chart number two is silver. We had gold yesterday. We talked about that bounce in gold, uh, the GLD and gold ETF, and uh, and also some of the gold stocks. Interesting, on our last episode of The Pitch, uh, one of my guests, Leslie Juflas, uh, did a good job of uh, talking about gold and gold stocks, talking about Newmont mining and potentially bouncing higher. So far, it was a great call because in the last week, those uh, have bounced higher. By the way, you can go to stockcharts.com slash The Pitch to watch that latest episode and all the previous ones as well. We're going to talk about silver today, testing trend line resistance. So if you go June, July into August into where we're at today, we are testing that uh, trend line from below. And so overall, the idea is the trend is in place until proven otherwise. We are now potentially going to the next week's silver contract or the silver uh, ETF SLV breaking above trend line resistance, breaking above the 50 day moving average. I'll be looking to see if that continues. I'd also be keeping an eye on the, uh, the RSI uh, and see if it can get above 60. That would confirm a rotation to a more bullish phase. Finally, our last chart, American Express AXP. If you look at this chart, Everything is not breaking uh, onward and ever upward. There are stocks that are struggling. And I'm looking at a chart like AXP breaking below its 50-day, testing it from a below, and now rotating back uh, lower. Breaking below that swing low from mid-August would potentially be a very negative sign for a chart that is very much starting to underperform. So there are stocks that are struggling. I would be screening for stocks making new swing lows at all times. Folks, that is our show for today and a wrap for this week. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. To recap any of our episodes, particularly some of our fantastic guests that we've had recently, I'm so thankful for some of those conversations. Go to stockcharts.com slash, excuse me, stockchartstv.com to see uh, latest episodes of the final bar and all of our previous episodes. Also, you'll find all of our great interviews on our YouTube channel. Just search, search for stock charts there. For everyone here at Stock Charts TV, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a great long weekend. We'll see you on Tuesday of next week. 
Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.